Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. My name is Cyrus Fernando and we are live and interactive. And maybe this is the first time you've ever seen the Q&A show before. Well, if it is, then this is your opportunity to send in your question. This program is all about our viewers and we want you to use this opportunity to write in. You can email us live at revelationtv.com or SMS details are also on the screen. And tonight, to answer all of your questions, we've got Dr. Grady McMurtry. Dr. Grady there. Yes, sir, and ready and able. <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us on this program. And it's always wonderful. We get so much wonderful feedback from our viewers to say how much they enjoy the Q&A show and also enjoy it when you're on. So it's great to have you with us. How's things? You're in Florida now. You're at home in Florida. Back home in Florida. I'm glad to say we don't have any storms at the moment, so <laughs> that's good. But we've we've had some serious storms the last few days. Wow, really? You always have storms, Grady, isn't it? Florida is always famous for hurricanes. I mean, I was in Florida a few years ago and I got stuck in a Hurricane Irma, and I have to say that was an experience and a half. But are you just now used to it, Grady? Well, it, it's only six months out of the year. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting how apparently uh, Spain doesn't want them, so they send them across the Atlantic to us. <laughs> You're more than welcome to have them, Grady. <laughs> They're all yours. <laughs> We're going to send you some sunshine. Now, we'll, send you... <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you some sunshine, Grady. We love you, really. Grady, there was an article that I saw, and uh, it's talking about 3D printing. Now, before I cover this article, for any of our viewers who may not be aware of what it means, because it's a term we often hear in the news, hear in the media, 3D printing. Can you give our viewers a little bit of an insight into what is 3D printing? Well, sure. Uh, there are actually different kinds. You, it's not just one technology. There's actually about uh, eight to 20 of them, depends on how you break it down. But the idea is, Basically, we take plastics, we take monomers, we melt them with lasers, and we build objects. And it's the building up of an object rather than taking a piece of steel, you know, a, a solid piece of steel and drilling it and shaving it and that kind of thing. Uh, so instead of going down, we actually build up. And it's done basically one time. Uh, the early 3D printers, we simply took powder and with lasers fused the material to make an object. Today, we are able to make every house uh, with this kind of technology. Okay, I'm just hearing some sort of feedback. It's incredible. Uh, we're going to call you back, Grady, and uh, we'll just see what happened there. It's incredible. We we did a test with Grady this afternoon. We just spoke to him over the last half an hour. We've been chatting away as always. And just as sometimes it happens, you uh, you go on the live program and there are some, some things in the system. So uh, no problem. We're going to call Grady. But use this opportunity to the viewers. Use this opportunity to send in your emails. Live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are on screen. And wonder if we've got Grady back. Let's see. How we do. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great to have you back. So we were talking about 3D printing. Now, this particular article caught my eye. And thank you so much for giving our viewers an insight into 3D printing. Just tell our viewers about this, because this article, it's the title of this article is Test Begins on 3D Printed Rocket Engine that could power UK space launches. It says this, new 3D printed rocket engines are being tested at the largest UK facility of its kind ahead of a potential space launch. Edinburgh-based Skyrora made them using its own Spy Print 2 machine for the first time, which the company says halves production time and reduces cost compared to previous designs. The new model will be put through its paces at a test hub in Midlothian, Midlothian on the sites of a disused quarry. It is the biggest rocket testing facility in the United Kingdom. Trials will take place every week in the coming months, with each tasking the engine with running for 250 seconds, the amount of time it would need to run in a real mission to reach orbit. Should the 3D printed engine trials prove successful, the firm plans to scale up production before further tests 
of its large stage launch vehicle, Skyrora XL, 23 meter tall rocket with a, pay, uh, with a payload capacity of 315 kilo, um, kilograms. Now, we've talked about 3D printing on a small scale, but this is obviously taking it to another level. What are your thoughts on this? Well, there's many parts of a rocket that could be made using this technology. Now, of course, there are certain parts that require uh, heat resistant materials that the plastic simply couldn't handle. But it's a perfectly valid way of building many of the parts uh, in anything, an automobile. Of course, today, automobiles have a lot of plastics. As a matter of fact, the quote unquote sheet metal on the outside of my uh, particular vehicle is plastic. It's not metal anymore. And so we can use it for many things as long as the temperature requirements are met by the plastic. Very interesting indeed. Now, Grady, emails have already started to come in. So uh, let's go into the emails. This one's from Anita. Anita, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And it says this, Hi Cyrus and Dr. Grady, thanks for a great show. My question is, before the world was created, there was God, the angels and the universe. God is perfect. And I thought he created the angels that way too. So how did Lucifer become full of pride, which is sinful, resulting in the fall from heaven? Where did this pride come from if everything was created from God? Thanks from Anita. That's an interesting one. Well, Anita, first of all, there's a slight error in your original question because the universe and the angels did not exist prior to the creation. Prior to the creation, there was only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in an eternity past, which we cannot fathom, really. Uh, but angels are created on day one, and they were created all perfect to begin with. Uh, and if you take a look in Ezekiel, as a matter of fact, God says that he made the person we call, or personality we call, Satan, uh, the devil, whatever term you want. Um, but he was created perfect, but iniquity was found in him later. Now, human beings were given 100% free will. However, angels have only a partial form of free will in the sense that they can make independent decisions. They are capable of rebelling against God, but they are not capable of being saved. There's no plan of salvation for them. What happens when we take a look at Satan being created in Ezekiel, and then we take a look at his rebellion, which is recorded in Isaiah. He was created perfect. Apparently, he was in charge of perhaps music and worship in heaven. That's not specific, but it seems likely. But he is called the covering chair, but he's above the throne of God. And he watches God create for six days and the seventh day of rest. Not because God's tired, because God has given us a template. And then, having said that, he says in Isaiah, I am going to do the same thing. This is where he rebels. This is where iniquity is found in him, that he is no longer obedient 100% to God, but he rebels against God's plans, and then is judged by being cast to the earth. And he is then the father of lies. He deceives Adam and Eve, causing men. Grady, we've got some sort of audio interference. We're going to call you on the phone and we're going to speak to you on the video. OK, so we're going to call you. We're going to call you on the phone right now. So just stand by with us, Grady, as we call you. I just want to remind our viewers, thank you so much for staying tuned. And this is the time when emails can be sent. So start writing emails. I can see emails are coming through and we're going to be asking Grady those questions very, very shortly. You've got the email live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are on screen. But I want to remind our viewers, because we're always reaching out to new viewers, we're on a recently launched on Freeview, which we're so excited about. We're always getting new viewers. This program is called The Q&A Show. We're live every Monday evening at 10 o'clock UK time. So if you want to join us, join us every single week. We're either joined by Pastor Derek Walker from the Oxford Bible Church or Dr. Grady McMurtry as well, creation scientists. And uh, want to tell you also about our website, revelationtv.com, where you've got the video on demand system and you can see all the previous programs that we have recorded because so much information is shared during these programs. And I uh, really want to encourage you to go back and watch them again in case you've missed any, any, uh, any of the programs there. But this 
Also, I mentioned we've got Freeview, and I want to just show you this little promo now to tell you a little bit more about it. Tell you, friends. For many years, Revelation TV has been available on Freeview, but only as part of a portal of 40 other TV channels, which has made it difficult for people to find us. The good news is that now we have our own channel and EPG number on Freeview, which is 281. This means you will find us much faster than before. The only requirement for you to be able to watch Revelation TV is that you have a smart TV with Freeview built into it and that you are connected to the internet. Freeview describes itself as the biggest TV platform in the UK, saying that they are in 18 million homes. It is said that every smart TV produced in the UK has Freeview built into it, so people do not have to pay any subscription fees or costs or sign up to receive their favourite TV programmes as they do with Sky. Revelation TV is an award-winning British television channel broadcasting for over 20 years. We broadcast to many countries across the world, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. As a Christian channel, we probably have the most live and interactive programs than any other Christian TV channel. We broadcast relevant and important biblically-based shows that include current affairs from a Christian perspective. If you want to find out the latest news on world events with a Christian input, then watch our flagship program, Our Mornings, on weekdays, Monday through Friday. Dive deep into the Bible and gain a fuller understanding with the Bible Study Team. You have questions about the Bible? Then join in on the Q&A show and email in at live at revelationtv.com and have your questions answered by Bible scholars. Keep up with current events of Israel and the Middle East on the Middle East Report. Interested in the occult and the spiritual world? Then tune into the Twilight Zone program and get a better understanding of how best to discern truth from fiction. Also join our church service live on Sunday mornings and become part of the Church Without Walls family. Along with many other programs, Revelation TV is dedicated to spreading the Word of God around the world. There are various ways to watch Revelation TV online on our website at www.revelationtv.com or on Sky, Apple TV, Freeview and various social media platforms. However, if you have Freeview, you can now tune into channel 281 and instantly start watching Revelation TV. For any information on how to watch Revelation TV or any other questions relating to the channel, please contact our office on 0208 972 1400. Please note our offices are only open on weekdays from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Or you can email info at revelationtv.com. Remember, now is the time for a revelation. Thank you for watching. There you go. That's Freeview Channel 281. We're so excited to be on Freeview. So tell all your friends and families they don't need to buy any extra material. It's usually built into your television device as well. You just need to be connected to the internet and you'll be able to watch us on Freeview Channel 281. Dr. Grady there, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, which just proves that we are live, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. We're definitely live, Dr. Grady. There's no doubt about that. Let's get back into the questions. Duncan and in Inverness has said, uh, written in to say, Dear Cyrus and Dr. Grady, thanks for questions and answers. It's a great program. Can you please explain in detail your comment that nothing created can be greater than that which creates it? Are we talking about size, intelligence, power or what? Basically, it applies regardless. What I said was that no one can create anything greater than themselves because obviously they wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't know anything more than they know. So that if I were to build a robot that uh, knew everything I knew and could do everything I could do, it wouldn't be greater. At best, it would be equal. I can't teach what I don't know. And therefore, it's not a question of size or any other specific thing. It's a total package where you cannot create anything greater than yourself. So God can't create anything greater than himself. He wouldn't be capable of it. The same thing is true of us. I mean, when we make an automobile, we are greater, far greater in complexity than the car. Hey, the second question here, Grady, is from Duncan as well. And he's asking, why did you include E equals MC squared under the, under the first law of thermodynamics? 
Blessings from a daft civil engineer, Duncan in Inverness. I love that. Thanks, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Duncan, I will be in Inverness next month. <laughs> I'll be passing through. Love it. Um, again, E equals MC square is simply the Einstein mathematical formula that energy and matter are equal in the sense that you can make mass into energy, you can make energy into mass. We've done this in, in laboratory experiments. But nothing is ever lost. Now, the first law of thermodynamics says that you start with 100% and you end with 100%. And it is exactly what E equals MC square does, that they are equal. They, you never get less. You can convert it from one state to another, but you don't lose anything in the process. Hopefully that's answered Duncan's question. So thank you very much indeed for that, Grady. Uh, the next question, there's no name on it, but it says, why did Jesus say strive to enter in that into the straight gate? For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Well, again, striving is an effort. You know, we, we don't just sit back on the couch and watch the TV and then expect to get into heaven. We strive in the sense of our effort. We, we express our love to others. We express our love to God. Uh, we often do this through works. Uh, as a matter of fact, the fourth sacrifice of the Old Testament, the, the meal or grain offering, had to do with acts of service acceptable to God. So striving is that we make effort. Um, yes, Jesus has provided our salvation through his atonement on the cross, uh, so that the, the salvation experience is provided for through grace. But we aren't simply to stand back and not do anything. We're to then do something with it. Because if we were not to do something, if we were not to make efforts forward uh, to, to make ourselves better, that's the, the sanctification process of maturing, but also to benefit others, we're not expressing the love of God around us. And we're supposed to. You know, they, again, we're, we're to not only have our sins taken care of by the blood of Jesus, but we are to work to expand the kingdom. And so we strive. That's where this word comes from. Thank you, Grady, for that. This next one's from Satinda, and it's interesting talking about UFOs. And UFOs have been in our news very, very recently. And even uh, Simon Barrett's presented some programs talking about UFOs and aliens and such things as well. But this question's from Satinda. Say, good evening to you both. I'm sure Dr. Grady has heard of the recent disclosure by former intelligence official David Grush um, that the U.S. government possesses craft of non-human origin. I think we're already all in agreement that aliens and UFAs are just an enemy deception. However, going by recent activity around this subject, how close does Dr. Grady believe that we are to a disclosure by the US government on this alien phenomena? Blessings from Satinda. So what do you think, what do you make out of all this UFO talk? Well, we've discussed this before. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, sightings of uh, UFOs, the sightings of alien beings or supposedly alien beings is nothing but demonic activity. Uh, again, if God's angels can take the form of humans to speak with us, to communicate with us, and there are many examples of that in the Old Testament especially, then certainly the fallen angels that serve Satan can take form of creatures that are not human and therefore alien to us, and can even take the shape of objects. After all, they are supernatural beings. They don't have physical bodies like us, and therefore they can transform as they wish. But they're providing evidence to deceive people who want to be deceived that such things are true. Basically, it's an attempt to get people to believe that evolution is true and that God is not God, that mm -hmm. we, we didn't come about as the Bible explains to us but that there was some other god or there was simply a random chance that caused us to come into existence. It is simply deception. This next question here, Grady, is from Clara. And Clara, thank you so much for writing in. Yes, this is the right platform to send in your questions. No problem at all. She's asking this. Hi, Grady. Is it biblical for a divorced Christian to remarry when their ex is still alive? I'm not really clear about this. Please pardon me if this is not the right platform to ask. Thank you, Clara. And please kindly answer that question, Grady, if you can. 
Well, I, I will answer it, but it's more of my personal opinion, perhaps. But the Bible is very clear. If you have been divorced and the previous spouse passes away, you are absolutely free to, to marry another. That, that part is clearly biblical. But even Paul, in talking about this, says, I'm giving you my opinion, not that of, the, not of God, when he talks about some of these things. Now, I, I believe that God wants us to enjoy life, certainly. Um, not that we should treat divorce lightly. It's a very serious topic. There are other things we could talk about along with it, such as abuse and so forth. But yes. nonetheless, you know, God loves us. He wants us to enjoy life. Now, biblically, it appears best that you not remarry as long as the first spouse is still alive. But I take the a little more grace to it that if that spouse, for instance, was divorced because of a very abusive pattern, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's physical or mental, mm. or both, that you have good reason to separate. Yes. And then we want to reconcile. So we, we want to try to reconcile before divorce. We want to have counseling, etc. But there are people who simply refuse to do that. Now, there's the, the value of human life is above the law of marriage. So if we've got an abusive situation, and this is why the divorce occurred, then there's the separation, then if necessary, the actual divorce itself, and I would point out, uh, even to the point of physically uh, having people move to an unknown location, that I think that the Lord has enough grace that would allow you to find a suitable person to be married to, uh, but that's my opinion. Certainly, the biblical counsel would be best not to, um, unless it's for a really, really good reason. What advice could you give to our viewers who may be going through difficulties in their marriage? Like you say, they could be suffering from an abusive marriage, and obviously, uh, mentally abusive is equally as harmful as a physical abusive marriage. What recommendations could they be reaching out to? Should they be speaking to their pastor? What do you think? Well, first of all, the pastor is. Uh, certainly the first person to perhaps reach out to, although there might be better counselors than the pastor. I mean, yes. again, depending upon the number of staff and various relationships, it can depend upon legal situations, what the laws are in a particular country or a particular province, etc. Yes. Um, but we serve a God of reconciliation. So we, we might separate, we would have counseling, But at some point, if it's absolutely irreconcilable, you don't keep sending a person back into a household where there's abuse. Yes. Because what will eventually happen is it literally can cause murder. I've shared with you before personal testimony of being in Russia where I have seen this happen, where pastors uh, incorrectly using Ephesians 5 would send men or women because men can be abused by women. This is women can be abused by men. Um, and actually ended up causing the death of a person. Wow. And in my opinion, uh, the pastor was therefore co equally involved with that murder. Wow. So we want to seek reconciliation, but if it's absolutely not possible, I say, and I'm not saying the Lord, but I say that not only should the pastor be involved or the counselor be involved, the Christian counselor, but even the church to the point of protecting them by sending them to to homes that have been set up specifically for abused spouses, um, and if necessary, even helping with the finances of a divorce, and then eventually, again, even moving them to another location where they cannot be traced. Because, again, the preservation of human life is higher than the law of human marriage. Uh, I've discussed this before. It's a very difficult subject. But sometimes, and this should be the rarity, but sometimes, in order to keep one of God's laws, you have to break one of God's laws. Mm. And when that happens, then you always break the lower, the lesser of the two laws. 
So the law of the preservation of innocent life is even higher than the law of marriage, though God considers the law of marriage to be a very high law. The preservation of innocent life is still higher. It's interesting. Over the weekend, I watched a very interesting interview, Dr. Grady. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a sports fan and a boxing fan. And there was a world champion boxer called Nigel Benn. You might be aware of him. And, um, and he was basically very, very well known in the 80s and the 90s. And within this interview over the weekend, he shared how during the peak of his career, he was successful. He had all the money in the world. He had all the power in the world. He had everything. He was married. He had a lovely family. And yet he cheated on his wife, Grady, for 16 years. And then one day he felt he needed to confess his sins to his wife. And what happened next was he went to live. He became a Christian. And the only way that the wife would forgive him, would he went and lived with his pastor for one whole year, took away all the money, all the big fancy cars, all the clothes, all the jewelry and everything for him to get back down to basics and really ask for forgiveness, ask for real forgiveness. And now he feels like the most blessed person in the world. He's, he's been forgiven by his wife as well. And it just shows Grady how temptation, some people can, can suffer from temptation. You sometimes see this, I think, in the celebrity world as well. And what's sad, Grady, is when you see the headlines of divorce or someone cheating as well is the normal public, the normal people are watching this and they're kind of getting these kind of ideas as well. What do you think? Again, this is when creeping liberalism comes into things. As a matter of fact, in my newsletter for July, I'm even writing about this. Uh, when you have, uh, as this gentleman had, all of these things, then you also think that you have the power to break laws even the law of marriage. But really, you don't. There are the consequences that follow that. Now, I'm glad to hear about the restoration of this person. I don't know them. I'm sorry. I'm not a boxing fan. Uh, but regardless of which, this is a great story of reconciliation, where there is obvious true repentance, because a person might say, oh, I'm going to do this for a week or two, and then stop. But if they do it for a year, yeah. it's proof. And that's, I think that was, he, he shared that was an experience he'll never forget for the rest of his life as well. So uh, thank God that God may, managed to intervene in that relationship and they're still together. Grady uh, Satinder talking about the UFOs that we mentioned earlier as well. is asking, how close do you, does Dr. Grady think we are to UFO disclosure by the U.S. government? What do you think? Satinder, <laughs> I wonder if you're paying attention sometimes. <laughs> This is demonic activity. The United States doesn't have alien spacecraft. They don't have uh, frozen aliens in a locker someplace, at, uh, well, out in the desert. Um, the fact of the matter is that these are simply statements by people that are, are not true. It's very interesting, actually. I've got an email here from Marilyn. We're talking about UFOs. It's a very, very interesting perspective. Listen to this one. UFOs. Hi, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Great show again. I watch a lot of these shows about the UFOs. I think there is a logical explanation for most of them. My favorite explanation is a tiny bugs are inside the camera that crawl or sliver across the screen that look like they are in the air. What do you think, Marilyn E. Wells? That's an interesting theory. <laughs> Well, I, I suspect that many, many years ago, there might have been one case like that. <laughs> <laughs> but today, <laughs> no. Very interesting. However, Excellent. You know, there, there, there's a very famous uh, quotation uh, by a science fiction writer uh, and is, is used, for instance, in the, the book, I, Robot, and made into a movie, that there's the ghost in the machine. Mm that no matter what you do to program, there's still going to be flaws. And sometimes those flaws will simply uh, appear to be pixels on a screen when there really is no object there. Yeah. Uh, so so I'm, I'm going to suggest you think of it as just ghosts in the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, this one's from Chris. Thank you, Chris, for writing in. Good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Chris from Penzance. As we know that the blood of Jesus covers our sins and we can then become blameless, would this mean that we are sincerely repentant and turn away from sin? 
At the moment of sincere repentance and turning away, we are blameless as if we did not sin. What do you think? Well, of course, we're dealing there with justification and sanctification. Justification is, uh, in, in one sense of the word, justification is that we accept the blood of Jesus to cover our sins, and from that point on, God will no longer hold our sins against us, and that allows us to go to heaven. But sanctification is the maturing process that continues. And in the book of James, he talks about how we all sin every day. Simply because you become a Christian doesn't mean you stop sinning. Now, you should not intentionally sin. You should be trying to, to mimic the life of Christ. That's why we're Christians, little Christs. But we all do sin, whether it's in thought or action indeed. Um, but we still have established an eternal relationship with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we still get to go to heaven. But we do not become perfect at the time of justification. And this is why he says to work out our salvation, which is the sanctification process of maturing, to, to learn the things of the Bible, to walk them out in our relationship with others and with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and so, yes, God will no longer hold our sins against us, and he accepts us to go to heaven, but we continue to sin regardless. Mm -hmm. It's just that we want to sin less. We want to be more like God would want us to be in our relationships with him and in our relationships with others. We've got 25 minutes to go, Grady. We've got lots and lots and lots of emails coming, and a lot more than normal as well, so thank you so much. We're going to try and get through as many as we can. Cynthia's written in to say, Dear gentlemen, I just want to thank you for such an informative show. Reading in the papers recently, they said that scientists are getting increasingly alarmed about the oceans getting warmer each year. I saw that. I actually saw the article that you're referring to. Even around our coast here in England, this has been the case. Then the news, we see all these ca catastrophic fires destroying everything in many countries across the world. Of course, global warming is always blamed for this, but can you explain the real reason why we're seeing this and will it calm down eventually? Thank you and God bless from Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia, bless you. <laughs> First of all, the oceans are not heating up. Um, the fires are from natural consequences of weather patterns shifting. Uh, there's a lot of things that I can say about this, and I do write a lot about this because climate change, global warming, global cooling is nothing to do with human beings. These are natural events. Now, remember that these evolutionists and what I refer to as environmental terrorists take news items today, which are so easily seen, but actually occurred 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, too, but we didn't know about them because we didn't have TV and satellites and, and that kind of thing. So, for instance, they talk about the fires. The truth of the matter is the amount of land being destroyed by fires today is less than it was 20 years ago. Uh, it's actually down significantly as a percentage. Um, one reason why we've had a lot of rain in various places, like here in Florida, we are in a transition at the moment from three years of a La Nina going into an El Nino. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, worldwide weather patterns shift from from the east to the west, back and forth. This has to do with the El Ninos, La Ninas in the South Pacific, which is a major driver of world weather patterns. And so uh, Venice having a drought, uh, or some other place like Spain having yeah, floods. Exactly. Is 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 based on these weather pattern changes which are natural, God caused. Now the earth itself and the oceans are continuously in a cooling process. The the earth is like a hot rock. You might think of it as a hot ember in a barbecue pit. And it is continuously losing more heat than it gets. So there's a slight loss regardless of what's going on. That's physics. In addition to which, sunspot activity and volcanic activity determine a great deal of the world's weather patterns. When sunspot activity goes up, the Earth generally gets a little warmer, and I say a little warmer, 
Uh, when the sunspot activity goes down, the Earth gets a little cooler. Uh, when we have the shift of El Nino and La Nina, of course, and volcanoes, because volcanic activity always cools the Earth, regardless of when it occurs or how much of it occurs. Um, so the question becomes, how much volcanic activity is going on, say, in Iceland? A few years ago, you had a situation where you had grounded aircraft yeah. because of a volcano. I remember Iceland. that, absolutely, yeah. Now, forgive me being an American citizen, but I know a little bit about UK history. If you'll go back into the 1700s, there was a volcano in Iceland that killed a ton of people in England, in the UK generally speaking, um, because of the ash and, and aerosols that came from it. Um, but people, you know, we, we tend to think of weather only in what happened today and what's going to happen tomorrow. We quickly forget what happened 10 and 20 years ago. We forget that we didn't have air conditioning in the 1930s. You know, uh, <laughs> lots of things about, you know, your parents said, go out and play regardless of how hot it is. Mm. And so we have a bad, bad memory when it comes to weather. But when we take a look at it scientifically, when we take a look at the data, actually, the number of hurricanes, and we've got two potential hurricanes forming in the Atlantic right now, um, well, the fact of the matter is they're not getting more numerous. They're not getting stronger because the oceans are cooling off over time. They were very hot after the flood of Noah when a great deal of hot water was added to the Earth's oceans from below and volcanic activity. It was a lot during the flood, cooled the Earth. That's why we had an ice age. But today we still have a fluctuation and you can't predict volcanoes. It's like I say about environmental terrorists. Um, you can't pass a law that will prevent a volcanic eruption. Thank you. Very, very interesting insight. Thank you, Grady, because I was going to say in Spain during the winter months, we didn't have any rain whatsoever. Spain suffered a huge drought. And then the, uh, the summer came, early summer, early summer weeks came. And now we've got all the rain coming now. It's just very, uh, very strange times. But thank you so much for your explanation on that, Grady. OK, this next one is from Kev. Kev from Chepstow's written in. Heavenly language. Hi, both. Great show as always. In heaven, do we speak the same language or our native language, which each and everyone understands? If one language, in if one language, do you think it's Hebrew? What a great question. <laughs> Very good question. Well, it's an interesting question. Now, the fact of the matter is, I don't know because I haven't been there yet. <laughs> You're not qualified. <laughs> but, 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 but I would say there's a biblical principle that we can take a look at. That's the Tower of Babel. From creation to the Tower of Babel, the human population only spoke one language. However, at the Tower of Babel, because people sinned and rebelled against what God had said to spread out and populate, repopulate the earth, um, God judged them by giving them 70 languages, or at least 70 languages are listed. Um, the question has always been, well, did God leave one and give 69, or did he give 70? My, my take on that is he gave 69 and left one. Because the time from creation to the flood is recorded for us. And they spoke the same language until the time of the Tower of Babel. Now, the flood's about uh, 2350 B.C., the Tower of Babel is about 150 years after that, roughly 2200 B.C. So people are still speaking the same language, and they're still recording using the same language. Now, that would include then the story of Noah, his three sons, uh, the story of Ham, and so on. Um, so my suggestion would be, because uh, they already had these writings, God would have left one and given 69 others. So I suspect it's going to be Hebrew, but don't quote me on that. Very interesting. That's a good one. Very good question. Uh, Kevin's written in asking about rainbows. Hi to you both. Were there rainbows before the flood? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the conditions for a rainbow, just, just think with me for a minute. What are the weather conditions that allow you to see a rainbow? Well, first of all, you have to have clear sky and sun behind you while you're looking into the distance at a curtain of rain. So you see a storm in the distance, but there's clear skies above you and there's clear sky behind you. And the sunlight is passing you, hitting the curtain of rain. And because of that, there's a prismatic effect 
that you then see the bands of color, the what we call the rainbow, right? Now, that could not have happened before the flood, because before the flood, there was too much moisture in the air. Uh, remember that uh, on day three, God creates the water above and the water below. Mm. Uh, the water below is the one-mile-thick layer of water below that is what flooded the earth at the time of the, of the flood when it comes up from below. But the extra moisture in the air uh, would have prevented the weather patterns that we see today. Temperatures would have been very mild, very little difference from pole to pole to the equator. Um, we didn't have the weather patterns. We didn't have things like thunderstorms and and the kind of frontal weather patterns you think of today. And because of that, the conditions to see a rainbow didn't exist. But after the flood, when extra moisture then comes down, uh, remember the 40 days, 40 nights of rain, for example, um, that extra moisture comes down, and there's no natural mechanism to put it back up again. So now we have these clear skies that allow us to see a rainbow. The second part of this is, Actually, that's not what it says in the Bible either. After the flood, God says, I put my bow in the sky, not my rainbow. Wow. And we have discussed this before. The bow and arrow are an ancient sign of peace or war. And when the bow and arrow are pointed towards you, it's a sign of war. When the bow and arrow are pointed away from you, it's a sign of peace. Now, if you think about it, the rainbow, it's like a bow and arrow, <clears throat> excuse me, with the arrow pointing away from the earth. And the rainbow was not a covenant between God and man. The rainbow was a covenant between God and the earth, that he would never again flood the earth the way he had at the time of the flood. But he is reserving the earth for a judgment by fire later on, mentioned in Second Peter chapter 3. And so, first of all, it's bow, it was a sign of peace, but most people think, therefore, it had to be a rainbow, which is where the translation rainbow typically comes from. Wow, that is extremely interesting. Thank you so much for that, Grady. Uh, this next one here is from uh, Dave to say, Hi to you both, Dr. Grady. What is your opinion on the Amish, um, Amish and Mem Memonites in America and the Hurrite, Hutterites in Canada? They all say that they are Christians, and from what I can see, they are nearer to God than we are due to their ways. If it differs, why? Can I have your opinion on this, please, from Dave? May I ask, was that Huguenots? Let me spell this for you. Uh, so this first one is Amish and Men oh, no, Mennonites, okay, in America, sure. and the Hutterites, H-U-T-T-E-R-I-T-E-S, Hutterites. Okay. First of all, um, the Mennonites actually come from Germany, uh, and they are Christians. Um, there's no question about that. As a matter of fact, I have ministered in a few Mennonite churches. The Amish are not. They have the trappings of Christianity. They will use the Bible. Uh, their sermons are often up to four hours long. Uh, they certainly... Uh, in their demeanor, have this great piety. I mean, that's what you look at. You see this piety in them. But they believe in salvation by works, which is not biblical. The Mennonites are true Christians. Uh, and so, as far as the Canadian ones, I'm not positive about that, I won't say. But in the United States, the Mennonites, which are the Christians that came, in some cases from mostly Germany, um, they are true Christians. But the Amish are not. They have the trappings of piety, but they do not believe in a salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. They believe in a salvation by works. Thank you so much, Grady. It still blows me away how viewers can write these questions in and you've always got an answer. It's incredible. Thank you so much. 12 minutes to go. The countdown has started. 12 minutes. Still so many emails coming in. The next one's from Samuel. Is it possible that prayer could never get to God? I read about demonic forces blocking prayer. If so, how do you deal with this, please? And that's from Samuel. Well, Samuel, I think you're dealing mostly with what's recorded in Daniel about how uh, Daniel had to pray and this helped the angel get through to bring his message from God and, and he'd have to fight his way back to the principalities, the powers of Satan to get back to heaven. Uh, but God hears every prayer. 
uh, think with me for just a moment. If God didn't hear every prayer, then how would we ever get saved? Now, God has basic answers of yes, no, wait. Uh, he knows better than we do. Sometimes we pray for things that are really not to our benefits if they were to come true. So he knows that ahead of time. And sometimes I know people get frustrated with God, but he, believe me, when he says no, he's got good reasons for it. The fact of the matter is, though, he hears all the prayers. Sometimes we think he doesn't hear them because he's saying, wait. Or maybe he said no, and you just weren't listening. Mm. <laughs> That's true. That is very true. Mark's written in. It's a little bit of a long question, Mark, so we're going to try and see if we can cover this because we've got so many other emails coming in. Mark's written in, say, good evening, Simon Grady. 1 Timothy 2, 4, New King James Version, says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, but certain scriptures seem to indicate that relatively few will be saved. So only eight people were saved in the ark from the flood out of the people that were dwelt that were that dwelt on the earth. Jesus said, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. And 1 Peter 3.20 also says a few that is just eight souls were saved from the flood. What are your thoughts as to whether only few people were saved? God bless from Mark. Well, first of all, let's make it very clear. God always saves a remnant, period. Now, it's easy to pick the eight at the time of the flood, but how about the 70 in Egypt with Joseph? I mean, we, God always saves a remnant. And even during the Exodus, God said to Moses, stand back, I'm going to wipe them all out and start over with you. God always saves a remnant. Now, the fact of the matter is, and I want you to listen carefully, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. Mm. That's everybody. Mm. However, however, it's referred to as the gift of grace. Now, a gift is not a gift until you accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even in Genesis chapter 2, when, when God presents Eve to Adam, Adam has to accept this perfect gift, and it's recorded for us in the Scripture that he does receive this perfect gift. And then God performs the first marriage ceremony. And so while God has provided the gift of salvation provided it for everybody through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only those who accept the gift possess it. And so when people fail to accept the gift of salvation, they condemn themselves. Wow. Powerful. Thank you, Grady. Susan's written in to say, good evening to you both, Cyrus and Grady. Do you think the moon landing was genuine or a set up by the Americans in the space race between America and Russia? That's from Susan. Under a minute, if you can answer that, please, Grady. I can. Susan, we absolutely went six times, landed six times. And the proof is the Russians never said we didn't. Uh-huh. Very good. Thank you. Short and sweet. Hi, sign Dr. Grady. Please, could you tell me if a person commits suicide, will he go to heaven? A person can commit suicide and go to heaven because suicide is not the unforgivable sin. The question is, have they accepted their salvation before committing suicide? And I just pray if there is anyone even contemplating that or have that thought, I pray in Jesus' name. That God comes into your heart right now and gives you that peace. Whatever you're going through in your life, whatever difficulties you're going through in your life, may the Lord Jesus Christ take it over. And I pray that for the peace of your life right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this next one's from uh, Mark saying, can you please explain? Head covering in core has the church that I go to use this. Head covering in core. Well, I, I think what they're talking about perhaps is the covering of women's heads in church. Yes. And, and, I, and I would say that that is a personal decision, first of all. I, I think it's personally, I think, that it's a little misunderstood. Uh, after all, it's just a physical manifestation of an inward belief. Um, however, Paul was talking about that the women should be covered. Now, I, I would suggest that that is, in fact, spiritual covering. But the physical covering is simply an outward expression that you are living within that spiritual conception. So there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think it's required. 
Six minutes to go, Grady. This one's from a viewer saying, 100% agree with Grady. We don't know what he agrees with because we've covered a number of questions <laughs> and answers, but he agrees with at least one of the things that you said tonight, which yeah, is at good. At least one. <laughs> <laughs> the next one. Grady, can you please tell us about your favorite part of salvation? Favorite part of salvation. That's the part I haven't experienced yet, which is getting to be going to heaven and being with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for eternity future. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't experienced it yet. What, have you, what is your favorite part of it, though? What would you say? Well, I, I, I have to explain that, that, again, Jesus tells us that in heaven we don't reproduce. And God made us with two purposes, to have fellowship with him and to, to procreate on earth. Well, in heaven we don't procreate, so what's left is the fellowship with God. And I think that that's the thing we need to concentrate on. Andrew's written in a question, hello, helping migrants is what I do, driven by the understanding of Jesus' second commandment of love your neighbor as yourself. So why do so many of those who claim to be Christians act in deeds or words against vulnerable migrants? And that's from Andrew. What do you think? Andrew, I need, I, I need to ask you to rethink things, okay? Now, we are to have compassion. We're to help those that, that need food, shelter, clothing. Certainly, that's a Christian perspective. But I would suggest that you take a hard look at this, because I am completely in favor of legal immigration. But I am not in favor of illegal immigration. And I would give you the Samaritan, the good Samaritan. What happened? He saw a Jew who the religious leaders and others uh, saw the need, but would not help. And God condemned them for that. The good Samaritan, who was not even a Jew, took compassion on the man and took care of him, but he didn't take him home. He took care of him where he was. And so be careful, brother, because illegal immigration is not something that is a Christian position. As a matter of fact, I would suggest you take a look at the statement of Jesus who says that the sheep go in and out of the gate, but the one who goes over the wall is a thief. Thank you so much. Grady, we've got about three minutes to go. Let's try and see if we can squeeze a couple more in. Paul and Ruth saying, uh, hi, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Why does God allow the enemy to cause so much deviation and deception when according to God's word, we are already seated in the heavens? From a spiritual standpoint, we are seated with Christ, joint heirs with him, adopted sons and daughters. That's true. But the Christian walk is in a world that's unsaved. You know, bad things happen to good people. Uh, sometimes we don't think that bad things happen to bad people, but they will eventually. The fact of the matter is that we have to take a look at our surroundings. And sometimes God will use our surroundings to guide us, to correct us, uh, to give us opportunities to share and to help. I mean, there's many things that are involved with that. Okay. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would just act as a Christian should in the environment you're in. Important emails come in from Leslie in North Wales. Uh, hi, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. My daughter and son-in-law, son-in-law's home has an unfamiliar spirit in their home. It stays a while, then leaves a while, but returns. Had lots of prayer. It's frightening for the children. Shadows on the walls, faces at the windows, appliances breaking down without explanation. They're also, they're also always getting ill, mostly stomach buds. Can these pr spirits bring sickness? That's from Leslie in North Wales. What do you think? Well, first of all, sickness is not always from some kind of demonic activity or some, as you've said, spirit. Um, I would suggest that if your prayers and that of these people have not been able to cast this thing out, you need to get some mature Christians who are used to dealing with these things, with the dealing of casting out of spirits, because there are Christians who are trained to do this, and have them come to the house. But remember, once you clean out the house, you cannot leave it empty. You know, you've got to fill it with the Holy Spirit. These, these demonic activity cannot come back again. This is very close to what Jesus was talking about with the demoniac. 
Susan's written in, say, good evening, Cyrus and Greg. Do you think the moon landing was genuine or a set up by the Americans <laughs> in the space race between them? I think we read that one already, Grady, did yeah, we not? Yeah, I did that one. This interesting one came from Satinder, and he's saying you're still not answering his question. <laughs> he's written in three times. He says, greetings, Cy, again, once again. Already we made it very clear in the first email that I know that aliens are not real and just deception. This isn't the question. My question was, how close is the US government to disclosure? Whether or not they are real is irrelevant. The question is being dodged over. <laughs> you can try again, please, Cy. So what do you think? No, I wasn't dodging it, Sintinda. What I said was, since there's nothing real to reveal, they mm. can't do it. Mm. They don't have anything to reveal. This is simply who some, somebody is making a claim but it will never be fulfilled. This next one, Grady, is from uh, an email, probably the last one, saying, Hi, folks, I just watched a program about Alexander Litvinenko. I hope I spelled his name correctly. I wondered if the KGB, etc., still have access to extremely powerful poisons could or on ordinary people and target Mr. Litvinenko as he's murdered by the Russian hierarchy. Do you have any thoughts on this quickly? Oh, they definitely do. They have poisons and they have things like Radioactive isotopes. After all, you had a, a Russian spy die in the UK from polonium poisoning. Okay, Grady, we are at the end of this program. I definitely don't want to finish on that negative and fear and everything else. And I just want to lift on a, a positive. We have our hope in Jesus Christ, regardless of all the wars, the rumors of wars and everything else going on in our lives today. We need to keep our lives in God's hands and trust in God's hands. And I pray peace in the lives of every single one of our viewers who are watching us tonight. I want to say Dr. Grady McMurtry, thank you so much as always for joining us on the Q&A show. God bless you, brother. And a big thank, thank you, you to all our viewers. Thank you so much. Don't forget our video on demand section. Go on to our website, revelationtv.com. I pray for the peace of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye.